Hello, my name is Sam Bart. I am the project manager for Evolution 2.0. And here's my special guest. I have Perry Marshall, a world renowned author and the founder of the $10 million science prize of Evolution 2.0. Hi, Perry. Good to be here. Hey, We're going to talk about how would somebody actually win this today? So yes. it's a very interesting topic. So can you explain to me how exactly could somebody possibly win this prize? Well, so let's talk about what we're asking for. Um, this is uh, this is a origin of information, which is really origin of life. Like, where did life come from? I think where did life come from is such a complex question. You've got to start with something simpler. Um, uh, if there, and I, I think if there's any way to eat the elephant one bite at a time, let's go right to what I think is the most central question, which is where does code come from? Because a cell requires a genetic code and genetic code is instructions. And the instructions are very much like digital computer code. There's only like a thousand books about that in the world. Um, so where does code come from? Well, that gets you to a question of where, where do choices come from? Now, I'll get to that in a minute because code is choices. Mm. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but, but let's just talk about, so what is the prize asking somebody to do? Let's, let's start with that. Right. So the prize is saying, I want you to start with chemicals and end up with code. So... Maybe that means that you pour a bunch of chemicals in your bathtub and you have them at the exact right temperature and the exact right concentration and the exact right everything. And somehow by whatever you did to set up the initial conditions, you got one end to send signals to the other end in, in the form of digital code. Maybe, maybe the signals tell you that what the temperature is in some data format that could be recognized. And if the other side can recognize it and convert it to something, then you had an encoder, a message, and a decoder, and that is communication. So Sam, if I send you a text, I pull out my phone and I type things into my phone and I press send and your phone gets a text and you read it, my right. phone encoded, the, you know, the cell phone towers uh, sent a message and you your phone decoded, encoding, right. message, decoder, so, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, the simplest, uh, you know, kids talking to each other through a tin can telephone with some words, or whether it's some big complex technological thing like the internet, it's still, right. it's code, it's communication. And so we're looking for where, where does communication come from? And if, if somebody can solve that any way, shape or form and do it under any conditions, We'll write them a check for $100,000. But if it's patentable, our investment group will pay for all the legal expenses and we'll get a patented too. And then we'll pay the Discover $10 million and we'll partner them into the next company that we create with us. And it would undoubtedly be a huge technological advance if we do that. So, so that's the Evolution 2.0 prize. We announced it at the Royal Society about a year ago. And uh, we got judges from Harvard, Oxford, and MIT. It's been written up in scientific journals. It's been written up in Inc. and Forbes and a whole bunch of places. So what I thought we might do today is, uh, since I've been thinking about this and obsessing about this literally for about 15 years, how do I think somebody might solve this? Now, if I knew how to solve it, I would just go solve it. Right. Okay, I don't know how to solve this. Um, I don't think anybody knows how to solve this right now, but I've had some very serious scientists come to me and say, I'm gonna solve this. Uh, Lee Cronin from uh, University of Glasgow, for example, uh, he's a world renowned chemist. He's like, I'm gonna solve that. There's an interview in, in the podcast um, where, where the, uh, we talk about that, um, but, so let's talk about like where the solution might be found. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to, I've got about a dozen books here and I'm just going to hold them up and tell you a little bit about them and say, 
this is a rock that somebody could turn over and go look for a solution. So, so that, that's, that's what we're doing today. Um, the, the, first, the first one I want to put in front of you is What is Life by Erwin Schrodinger. Um, he is a very famous physicist. Um, uh, and he wrote this book in 1943. Wow. And it, okay, it, yeah. And uh, not, not only that, in 2018, I went to a conference in Dublin, Ireland called What is Life? And it was the 75th anniversary conference of this book. And six Nobel Prize winners were there. Wow. And they were, they were still talking about the questions raised in this book. Like most books written in 1943 are almost useless. Right. Right, but you think he, as far as technology, modern technology goes, right? So, can you tell right. us a little bit about the questions that he asked in that book? Well, so this this is why the book is so good is he defined the really the questions really well, and so there are, there are two things that people especially remember about this book. Um, he described DNA as an aperiodic crystal. Um, which the word aperiodic means like it's not just the same repetitive pattern over and over right. like salt crystals. Right. Um, but, but it's like a continuously varying pattern. Wow. Um, and he, he was, that was not too far off. Okay. Yeah, that was ahead of the time. Very much. And, and he introduced an, an extremely useful term called negative entropy or neg entropy and entropy is when toast gets cold when it pops out of the toaster and it doesn't get warm again it only gets cold okay and exhaust comes out of your muffler it doesn't go back in right. okay that's entropy right well he said living things exhibit negative entropy they don't turn order into disorder they turn disorder into order you clean up your room, you build a company, you, you know, you, you cook food over a fire. Right. Okay. You make order, not disorder. You order the world around you. You build a house. Yes. Right. You put a fence around your yard and all living things do this sort of thing. Yes. And, and he said, they're not violating the laws of physics when they do this, but there must be some other law of physics that we don't understand. Wow. Okay. Now, I think I think he hit the nail on the head. Now, a lot of people have read that and go, yeah, that's kind of what they appear to do. Well, no, I think that's what they really do. Right. And I agree they they don't they don't disobey a law of physics. I, I don't think they do. Things still decay even after you build a house. It still decays, but the act of building a house is the opposite of decay. Right, right. And so um, now, I, I'm going to come back around to the subject of negative entropy in a few minutes, okay? But I think that is the central question. Like, what is the source of making order? Right. What is it? Okay? And this question has, it has perplexed and bothered and and angered and frustrated scientists and people have argued about this because life is so obviously different than mine life and there's a whole bunch of people who go oh no no it's really the same like you know even a six-year-old can tell right. you know the difference between a live bird and a dead bird is like <laughs> right? right okay so so this is a great starting point for the whole journey um all right. Here, here's an um, here's another book. Um, Mind and Cosmos by Thomas Nagel. He is a philosopher in uh, at a university in New York, and this book uh, created quite a stir when it was introduced, something like eight or ten years ago. Mm. And this book does not have any answers. It only has questions. It's a very respected philosopher who happens to be an atheist, by the way. Oh, wow. And, and, and the thesis of the book is, in the universe, we have this thing called consciousness, and nobody's physical laws explain any of it. Right. And who's kidding who? Like, and he, 
he has a lot of negative things to say about the standard Darwinian synthesis. Mm. Um, uh, he, he, he describes it as a, a triumph of ideology over facts. Right. Um, but he's not in a position to solve any of these problems, but he is definitely like, hey, people, the emperor has no clothes. Right. And we have not figured this out and stop pretending that we figured this out. So, so that's uh, Mind and Cosmos by Thomas Nagel. And we'll put links to all these books on, uh, on, the, on the page. Okay, here's, an, here's another interesting book, From Logos to Bios by Wynand De Beer. Uh, now, I know this guy. Um, I, well, he, after he reached out, um, uh, after he wrote, wrote, read, wrote the book, I reached out to him because I thought it was very interesting. And what he does in this book is he explores the view that the Greek philosophers had about biology 2,500 years ago. And he says, they were more right than wrong. Now, the Greek philosophers have largely been rejected by biology and science in the last 100 to 200 years. The Greek philosophers believed in Logos and Telos. Logos is the, um, it is the, the power of words and language. It's the power of intentionality. It is, um, the, the Greeks defined the Logos as the thing that bridges the gap between the eternal principles of math and geometry and that sort of thing and the dynamic ever-changing world that we live in, that there has to be some connection between, you know, the, the eternally pure principle and the active evolving world. And they called out that the logos, and they absolutely believed that it was all very purposeful. And around the turn of the 20th century, the beginning of the 20th century, um, biology wholesale rejected the notion that any of it was purposeful. Wow. I think in complete defiance of what is plainly obvious right in front of your eyes. Right. And, and as we know from politics and everything else, people can do that all the time. Right. They, there's all kinds of versions of, no, the sky isn't blue, the sky is orange. No, the sky isn't blue, the sky is purple. No, the sky isn't blue, the sky, you know, right. magenta, right? This, this happens all the time. We're swimming in it in the news media, so it's no surprise that somebody might... But I think they were completely wrong. And, and this is a really great book. And it explores this. And uh, I'll, I'll also just add that I, I think one of the reasons that Lynn Margulis um, was such a good scientist was she read the Greek philosophers when she was 16 to 18 years old at the University of Chicago in a original writings program that they had there. And Michael Ruse talks about this in a book uh, that he wrote about the Gaia hypothesis. And um, basically, I think the rejection of Greek philosophy is a big, a big reason why uh, science has gotten itself backed into a real serious corner in biology. Um, uh, science, science doesn't have any explanation for origin of life. It doesn't even have a good explanation for why things evolve, right. um, which is a whole nother conversation. So, um, all right, next book. Um, Biocentrism by Robert Lanza. Um, this is a book about the relationship between conscious observations and measurement in quantum mechanics. Okay, this is a very well-known problem um, you know, with a whole bunch of different interpretations of what it means. But, you know, there's a double slit experiment in quantum mechanics where uh, depending on what you are looking for, you either get a particle or a wave, and it depends on what you're looking for right. uh, as to what you actually get. And so the observer and the act of observation actually changes the measurement, that the measurement is not complete until the observation is made, which is very, it's a very mind-bending idea. And he explores this idea and he explains it in great detail, and he says, biology is firmly in the world of things where conscious observation 
is the determining factor and and that we're we're ignoring this okay mm -hmm. and so and 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 we can't get out of the traps of a reductionistic mindset until we acknowledge this and and this is really the way out so that that is that is the essence of that book okay now mm -hmm. let's let's go back to schrodinger's neg entropy or negative entropy so um Paul Davies has a book called The Demon in the Machine. Um, Paul Davies is the guy who invited me to Arizona State University to announce the $5 million um, evolution prize when it was at 5 million. And uh, I've become friends with him since, but I've been reading his work for years and years. He's a pretty famous scientist. And this book explores um, the idea of, of biological organisms possessing a point of intentionality that he, uh, that he calls the demon in the machine. Mm. And this is based on a thought experiment by James Clerk Maxwell from 150 years ago. So Maxwell is the guy who figured out Maxwell's equations, which are the backbone of electromagnetism mm. and fields and waves and antennas. Okay, it's like, I mean, I would say Maxwell is easily one of the top 20 scientists in history, okay? And Maxwell uh, was interested in all kinds of stuff. And one of the things he was interested in was thermodynamics. Um, and the whole subject of entropy and why does your toast get cold instead of warmer when it pops out of the toaster. And he, he came up with this brilliant realization. Uh, he said, okay, you got a refri let's say you got a refrigerator and it's turned off. So the outside and the inside are the same temperature. He said, if I had a little, demon, little tiny microscopic my, molecule sized demon with a door, mm. a refrigerator door, if he could see, so at that level, there's cold particles and hot particles all mixed together everywhere, right? There's right. slow molecules and there's fast ones and the fast ones are hot and the slow ones are cold. Yeah. If the demon could open the door when a hot one came zinging by and, and go in like out of the refrigerator and then let a cold one in, if he could just open that door right. at the right times, yep. it would get colder and colder and colder in the refrigerator. Right. And he would, and the laws of entropy would be reversed right okay and well gee you know if you had those in your car engine you wouldn't need any gas right right because you could just let hot air into the cylinders and then they could push the cylinders and out they would go right okay so this, yeah. this is a really yeah. okay and and so as soon as so then you start asking, well, is that possible? And what would that involve? And eventually what people figured out was this. The demon has to see what the molecules are doing in order to open the door. And the act of observation of the molecules consumes energy. So if that door existed, you would not violate the laws of physics because it would take energy for the demon to process the information to then open the door. So, so there really is no free lunch. Right. Okay. Right. But, but if you, here's where Davies goes with it. And quite a few authors have, have played around with this idea. Davies goes, okay, but what that says is, that information, while it, even though it consumes energy to process information, as everybody with a hot computer knows, right. 
right? And the laws of physics say the computer is going to get hot when it processes information. Like there's no, there's no way around that. Okay, but if, if you can consume energy and process information, you can create order out of disorder. And Davies says, okay, we don't know exactly how biology does it, but that's what's going on. Right. That life is cellular computation and processing. And so this is, so it doesn't violate the laws of physics. You have to eat, right? you know, to clean up your room and to paint your house, right? But so he's working out the details of the enigma. Uh, and he talks about lots and lots of interesting things in this book. So uh, it, it really is a great book and it goes into some great areas and it kind of isolates the information problem. Okay, now I want to show you another book by Paul Davies and his, his colleague, Sarah Walker. It's called From Matter to Life. And they're considering the same question, but they have a, a bunch of other authors in here. And they are, they are applying this Maxwell's demon question to where did life come from in the first place? Mm. Okay, and it's one of the best books on the information problem in biology that you can get. It is one of the best. And if you want to understand the evolution 2.0 problem, read this book. Now, he doesn't talk about evolution 2.0, and the book came out before any of that. But... I mean, he, it's exactly right. I mean, they haven't solved it, but they've defined it really well, okay? Now, I just, um, I want to insert, remember, remember that I talked about mind and cosmos um, and this, the consciousness problem, okay? So I think that the demon in the machine is the unit of consciousness, whatever that is. Now, I could be wrong. I'm perfectly happy to be wrong about this, but having thought about this and studied for 15 years, here's what I think is going on. Hmm. I think there is some construction of a mechanism that is capable of having and exercising consciousness, and that is the demon in the machine. And yes, the demon requires information, and energy and all of that. Okay. But at the end of the day, I believe that, that what turns chaos into order is choice. Mm. And choice is only made by conscious beings. Computers right. don't make choices. Rocks don't make choices. Dead planets don't make choices, but living things do. Right. One zero open the refrigerator door yes because he's got to decide to open the refrigerator door right now if you if you back it up a step you go oh but a computer program could just detect the information and open and close i know but you have to decide what the computer program would do right. and that is a choice you okay. cannot get away from choice okay so um, which actually brings it back to the Greek philosophers who believed that life was purposeful. Yes, it is. In fact, purpose is the only way that you turn order into chaos. Uh, sorry, chaos into order. Okay, now, next book. Uh, Laws, Language, and Life by Howard Patti. Howard Patti is in his 90s. He has been writing about this for 60 years. And what he has been saying for 60 years is that there is a dotted line in the universe. And on one side of the line is objects. And on the other side, side of the line is subjects. Mm. Objects are rocks. Hmm. and you know in buckets of water okay right. and subjects are beings and beings observe and act hmm. 
and generate language. Right. And they're conscious and they have perception and they don't do what they do just based on the past. They do what they do based on what they want to do in the future. Right. He says, now people have been arguing about the subject object dotted line for two, three, 4,000 years. Hmm. This is not new. Mostly that argument has been happening about humans and the mind and the body. Is there a soul? Is there a spirit? What really is a human being? Okay. Right. What Patti says is this problem goes all the way down to the cell. Hmm. Okay. And it goes all the way down to the most basic code DNA that a cell is a subject, not an object. Hmm. And I, I think, I believe he's right. Wow. Um, no, no do I, am I saying that cells, um, you know, brush their teeth and say their prayers <laughs> before bedtime? Like, I, no, I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what it means. But they do preserve themselves. Well, they, and they talk to each other. Yeah. Okay. There, there's a famous TED Talk by Bonnie Bassler called How Bacteria Talk. It's on the Evo2 website. It's probably my favorite TED Talk. Mm -hmm. And she explains in incredible detail how bacteria send all of these communication messages back and forth to each other at all kinds of different levels. Um, and so, like, I don't think there's any question that this is true. This is just really hard for some people to accept. They, right. it, it weirds them out. They're like, oh, my word. Like, the world is so weirder than I thought it was. So. <laughs> So, his, so the view that, that Patti espouses in this view is called semiotics, S-E-M-I-O-T-I-C-S. And it's the study of signs and symbols in biology. And there's, there's journals devoted to this. It's a whole, it's, it doesn't get a great deal of attention. It's, you could call it the study of linguistics in molecular biology, and it's a very deep subject. Um, I think it's one of the most important subjects. I think it's way underrated. Okay, so let's keep going here. Excellent. All right, um, next book, Dance to the Tune of Life, Biological Relativity by Dennis Noble. Hmm. Um, I admired Dennis's work for years. I eventually became friends with him and he came on the judging panel of evolution 2.0 he's an extraordinary scientist um one of the most celebrated scientists in great britain dennis has a theory that he calls biological relativity biological relativity says there is no privileged level of causation in biology. Now, I need to unpack what he means when he says this. I think this is a very profound insight. So Dennis is famous for figuring out what makes the heart rhythm work. Hmm. What makes the heart beat? He figured that out in the 1960s. Wow. He was the first person to model a human organ on a computer which he did in 1962, I believe. Wow. Okay. In, in the basement of University College London um, on borrowed computer time with punch cards. Huh. And he worked out all these differential equations of how the heart works. And his discovery about how the heart works has everything to do with his biological relativity theory. So let me explain it. So, your heart is not a watch, hmm. okay? So if you know anything about a digital watch, what you know is that there's a crystal and it vibrates at a certain frequency and something picks up the vibrations and they turn it into pulses and then the pulses get divided and they count out seconds and the seconds get divided into minutes and you have a digital watch. I mean, it's pretty simple and it just, it start, it's like start with this vibration and just start dividing it out. And the whole thing is a straight line. Hmm. Your heart does not work that way right. at all. 
okay, your heart has at least three major feedback loops mm. and they are redundant. Like there's three different systems and that this is a really like uncircumcised Philistine explanation <laughs> of Dennis's career here. Right. Okay. But, but there are, there are three, three systems where the information goes around in the circular fashion and they are influenced by all kinds of things in the body. You know, are, are you running or is that hot or is it cold and all kinds of other things. Are you nervous? There's all kinds of systems that, that affect those loops. And if you break the machinery of one of these loops, the other two will keep going. And so it's redundant. Mm. it's it's got it's got backup systems right. okay so you have to kill all three in order to kill the heartbeat okay and there is but here's dennis's point there is no one place where it starts mm. okay there's a there's almost a chicken and egg problem in every step of this loop okay so you know the the previous piece of information affects the heartbeat, but then the heartbeat affects the thing that affects that piece of information. And, and he says, everything in physiology is like this. There isn't one starting point for anything hmm. in biology, that it's loops within loops within loops and cycles and systems within systems within systems. There's no one system that is like in charge of everything. Hmm. And now this got him to realize that we had to completely revise evolutionary biology because for the last 50 to 75 years, we've believed that the gene is the starting point of biology. Hmm. He says, absolutely no, 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 it is not because not only do genes build the organism, but the organism modifies the genes. And right. not only that, you can't build an organism just from the genes. Right. Uh, which is a whole nother, it's, yeah. the genes don't have nearly enough information to build the whole organism, which yeah. is a whole nother conversation. Well, this is a very, very, very important reorientation of how you understand biology um it, it completely it completely changes your perspective on the whole entire discipline um and so i'm not gonna belabor this further you can read the book dance to the tune of life biological relativity uh if if you want to but um but notice that this is this everything that i'm telling you keeps reinforcing a holistic view of life hmm. rather than a reductionist view of life. Right. Okay. Now, um, next thing I want to talk about is fractals. This is the first fractals book that I ever read. Now there's lots of fractals book. I don't books out there. I don't necessarily say you ought to start with this one, start with anyone that you think looks good or any YouTube videos or what have you. But, Fractal patterns in nature are one of the most universal things that most people never quite notice. A, a fractal is a pattern and a pattern and a pattern and a pattern. So there's a tree outside and I can look at the whole tree. I can zoom in, zoom in, zoom into the trunk, zoom into the branches, zoom into the leaves, zoom into the veins in the leaves, zoom in the veins in the veins in the veins in the leaves. And I mean, literally at a million to one scale, there's branching, 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 and it just goes down and down and down and down. Well, there are all kinds of fractal patterns in biology. And um, a, another book, now, this is really obscure, it's also in French, hmm. but it's called, it's called Codex Biogenesis by Jean-Claude Perez. And Perez is um, a retired IBM uh, mathematician 
who studies genetics uh, in his retirement. And he's been writing books and papers for 10 or 20 years about the fractal patterns in the genome, in proteins, in DNA structures, and you can Google him and go find all kinds of interesting stuff. It's not usually easy to read because it's badly translated from French into English, but um, there, is a, there is an article on EVO2 called The Mathematics of DNA, which gives you a really um, concise summary of a paper that I helped him write about 10 years ago. Mm. And I think, well, I think that uh, fractals and self-organization are inevitably a component of where did life come from. Um, all right, we're, we're getting close to the end here. Um, next book. Uh, the Science Delusion by Rupert Sheldrake. Um, Rupert Sheldrake is a, I believe he was studying um, biochemistry or some related topic at Cambridge. Um, he, uh, and years ago, he came to the conclusion that most of biology was just missing the boat. Um, uh, by being too reductionistic. And he saw way too many giant questions that nobody had any answers for. Mm. Um, like, for example, the question of what determines the overall physical form of an organism wow. is not really known. Yeah. Okay. So like we know that electric fields make the body of a tadpole into the body of a tadpole and different electric fields make um, you know, a snake. Right. Um, but we don't know how those are generated. We don't know where those originally come from. Wow. And, um, but uh, Sheldrake also um, talks about, he, he, he says we have good reasons to believe that, biological memory is stored somewhere in the universe or somewhere and is accessible by means that we do not currently understand. Hmm. Um, and he, and so like one, one of the things that he talks about in one of his books is they did experiments where a guy who never goes home for lunch decides to go home for lunch and they put video cameras in his house uh, and watch his dogs. And when, when he gets a couple miles away from his house, the dogs know he's coming home mm -hmm. and they start acting like they do at five o'clock. Right. Um, and they showed with reliable statistical consistency that the dogs could tell that he was coming home, even though, you know, we don't know any, any mechanism that would make that true. Now, a whole lot of us human beings have had experiences of that sort, right. which we cannot explain, yep. but that we know, uh, you know, Carl Jung called it synchronicity. Mm. Um, and and I, I just bring this up to say that this whole sort of question, um, he, he, he talks about experiments with rats where if he taught rats in Boston how to run through a maze, rats in Australia would learn how to run through the same maze faster. Well, this, this kind of gets us to another book, which, which addresses the question at a, at a larger level. So this book is called Margins of Reality by Robert John and Brenda Dunn. I interviewed Brenda on the Evolution 2.0 podcast about a year ago. And this book was uh, written by the people who ran the lab at the Princeton University Engineering Anomalies Research Lab. For 28 years, uh, there was a department at Princeton that investigated psychic and paranormal phenomena. And uh, my friend Howard Jacobson recommended this book to me and I read it and I thought, 
This book is so boring, nobody could have ever possibly made this up. <laughs> um, now, the reason it's boring is it has excruciatingly precise descriptions of meticulously performed experiments wow. um, and how they all worked. And these authors are working against a bias in science that none of this exists. So they have to like triple document everything they do. Okay. Yep. Um, and they do. In fact, there's a huge body of literature around this kind of stuff. They proved with five nines of statistical confidence that beads falling from the ceiling to the floor could be slightly deflected by a person concentrating. Wow. And they, and they, could, oh get, <laughs> they could get the bell curve distribution of the beads that fell to the bottom to shift wow. measurably. That's really crazy. <laughs> one way or the other. They proved with five nines of statistical confidence that humans can change the outputs of random number generators slightly. Mm. They proved that people can, they call it remote viewing, send images from themselves to a recipient. And they describe in excruciating detail the experiment they did to show if you, you're sending me a picture and I'm drawing a picture, how good is my drawing? They had all these criteria for measuring the accuracy of the drawing. There's a whole bunch of stuff like this. In fact, if you get into the genre of literature that is in this book, that is cited by this book, um, you will find that there are thousands of scientific studies and thousands of scientific papers about this kind of stuff. And most of them confirm that these things do get results. The only thing is they don't know why it's true. They know that it's true. They don't know why it's true. And mainstream science publishing has never accepted this as real. And so it just gets ignored, but it's there. And if you have the ability to read a scientific paper and look at all of their setups and all of their tests and see if their conclusions match with their experiments, you can read it and decide for yourself. There are there are volumes and volumes and volumes of literature about this. Okay, what does this have to do with evolution 2.0? Well, I just simply believe that anytime you ignore something that you don't like, you don't know what it costs you right. to remain intentionally blind. Yep. Okay. Do 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 the um do the margins of reality experiments have anything to do with consciousness or Maxwell's demon? They might. Mm. Why wouldn't they? I don't know. But I, I don't think you certainly can't declare at the outset that they don't. Right. So I, I, think, there, I think there is something to look in there. Mm. Um, the, the last book that I'll bring to your attention is called The Fourth Phase of Water by Gerald Pollack. Um, there is, a, there's a whole body of literature around this. Uh, everybody learns in high school chemistry that water has three phases, water, steam, and ice. But there's a lot of researchers that say water has a fourth phase um, it, that at at a certain very small distances like nanometers um, uh, when in contact with certain kinds of surfaces like lipids, which are the fatty um, molecules and cells, that water exhibits a different set of properties than it does normally. Uh, and a lot of these people also say that water has memory. Mm. And there is a lot of work on this, and it's also been very vigorously opposed by reductionist scientists. So when you go into the subject, you're gonna find there's advocates and there's haters, and they are very passionate. Well, so read this book and the references, and 
the descriptions and the pictures and, and all of that, it's meticulously documented, and then start reading the other authors and, and so on, and come to your own conclusions. Um, I think that I have a suspicion that we'll never solve origin of life or even uh, major problems in life until we fully understand water. And I don't think we fully understand water. So there's, you know, literally six or eight or 10 rabbit trails that you could go down with all of which may have possibilities for solving the Evolution 2.0 prize. Excellent. Wow, this has been an amazing, I mean, overview of these different books and some very eye-opening and interesting questions posed by the different authors, which we'll have links below this video here on this page to each and every book that we've talked about. You can get it on Amazon or, you know, maybe wherever else. And we'd love to uh, hear your thoughts. If you could send us an email, comment on the blog. We'd love to see if you read these books, what you think of them and hear from you soon. Let's talk about it. Thank you. Thanks, right. Sam. Thanks, Perry. All right. Bye-bye.